Welcome to WMNF 88.5 FM and WMNF.org. You're listening to the Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. This Florida special legislative session begins today at noon. Because of new census numbers, the state is required to redraw congressional districts every 10 years. During the regular session that ended last month, the legislature passed a congressional map with new lines, but it was vetoed by Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis proposed the map last week, and Republicans in the legislature have said they will support it instead of suggesting their own maps. So joining us today to try to make sense of redistricting in Florida is Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. Thanks so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here, Sean. We're both named Sean. <laughs> Thanks. I'm so glad you could join us. Uh, it's, you know, it's the, the special session that starts this week, it's very important. It decides who, where the congressional districts are drawn, which means essentially who Florida will represent in, will be represented by in Congress. So let's begin with, with what's probably the most contentious issue of the session. The map that's being proposed by Governor Ron DeSantis would cut the number of Florida's black members of Congress in, in half. It gets rid of what the governor considers to be a racially gerrymandered district in North Florida, which is now held by Al Lawson. What are your thoughts about that district and whether you agree with the, the governor that it's, uh, that it's against the law? Well, I definitely uh, feel that it's uh, again that this is not this is a very uh, difficult issue because we need to have this district to represent our black voters and and the legislature actually came forward with a map that was somewhere in between and he has uh, rejected that as well. Um, the map proposed by the governor eliminates minority of voting advantage and diminishes the influence of black voters, as you've said, in District 10 by reducing the percentage of black voters from 50% to 35%. This violates the Federal Voting Rights Act, which prohibits any voting qualification or practice that results in the denial or abridgment of the right to vote based on race, color, or membership in a language minority. This includes congressional uh, redistricting plans. It also violates our Fair Districts Amendments, which was passed in 2010 by 64% of the state's voters. The amendment states that voting districts shall not be drawn to deny racial or language minorities uh, the equal opportunity to participate uh, in the political process. And this is precisely what the DeSantis map does by eliminating the North Florida Minority Access District. We believe it's crucial to our democracy to preserve the ability for minorities to be represented throughout the government, including Congress. And just a reminder to people that the reason that Governor DeSantis has given for why he wants to eliminate that, that black uh, majority voting district in North Florida is he considers it to be racially gerrymandered and that draws the question that in if you look at the map that's proposed by Governor DeSantis, there is another congressional district that stretches nearly as far as Lawson's district does. It goes from Polk County here in the Tampa Bay area, which is where Lakeland is and some other cities there, all the way to Hendry and Collier counties. And so that's a very, you would consider that, I think, on first look, maybe a, a really strangely drawn or possibly gerrymandered district that's just about the same length that is as the Lawson district that the governor is trying to get rid of in North Florida. And what's interesting is that the district that he says is gerrymandered was approved by the Florida Supreme Court and those maps were put into place. So we're talking about calling something gerrymandered that the courts have approved. Um, and the impact here is across the state. There's a significant impact on the district uh, for U.S. Representative Val Demings. There's, uh, I'm in Sarasota County. There's significant impact on Sarasota Manatee uh, districts. There's significant impact in uh, Hillsborough and Pinellas County on districts there. There's definitely impact in uh, the Miami area districts as well. So you know, what's puzzling here is the Republican legislature came up with a map that the leaders said 
was a fair map that basically adhered to uh, Fair Districts Amendment 4 and was a good map. And he's vetoing what his own legislature says is a good map. And then he's putting forward a map when really the governor, it is not their job to create the maps. In our constitution, it's the legislator's job to create the maps. So we're going into an autocratic kind of zone here uh, where he's vetoing these maps and putting forward his own maps and not allowing our you know, the process to work forward where this really is a legislative job, not the governor's job. And then if there's a challenge with that, it would go to the courts. So we have a three-tier system here, uh, executive, legislative, and the court system, and he's kind of mucking all that up, which affects everyone in the state of Florida. I want to remind people that our guest is Sean Bartlett. Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida, speaking us to live by Zoom from Sarasota County. And you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe here on 88.5 FM. It's 10, 12 in the morning. And if you can email me a question, if you have one at DJ at WMNF.org, you can text 813-433-0885. Please sign your name and let us know where you're calling from. If you have a question about the legislative session, the special session, or redistricting in general, and again, t- today is when Florida's special redistricting legislative session begins. There's They're going to kick off at noon in both the House and in the Senate. So we'll, we'll bring you that news as it comes throughout the day and the week. But right now we're talking with Sean Bartelt from the League of Women Voters of Florida about this new map that is being proposed by Governor DeSantis. And Sean, as you were saying, the governor is, in this case, is sending the legislature a map rather than the other way around, rather than the leg- legislature making a map. And uh, and then having the, the the governor decide to sign that or veto it, like he vetoed it in the regular session, you kind of started to to go down this path before. But what does that say about the independence of the legislature? And, and why does the I mean the legislature has essentially said, yeah, whatever map you give us, Governor DeSantis will sign, rather than saying, look, why don't we come up with the rules for the, our map that we're supposed to be doing, and then if you don't like it, you can veto that. What, what's shocking to me is, like I said, this is a Republican-based legislature that has come up with a map that they determined was fair and met all of the criteria for fair maps in the state of Florida, both federally and statewide, and that um, we really are urging the legislature can override the governor's veto with a two-thirds vote. So our question is, why are you not exerting your power that you have to do the job that you are mandated to do by our constitution? Why are you not take, doing that? And why instead are you taking a knee and just saying, okay, governor, do whatever you want? Um, we don't feel that that's a good solution. We really urge the legislature to uh, use their ability to uh, override the veto with a two-thirds vote uh, and stay in support of the maps that they drew through a long and tedious and researched process. Uh, and it was uh, bipartisan support of those maps at the end. Um, so it's really kind of violating the Constitution to, to do what the governor is doing right now. And we saw in the map that was released by the governor, you kind of mentioned some of the areas of the state where the map, it would be really completely with redrawn, that is. And the effect of this would be that of the 28 new districts that would be proposed, I think we're getting two two new seats, I think it is this year, uh, based on the census from compared with 10 years I ago. Think, I think it's one 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 new seat, but oh, that, yeah. that sounds right. We're going, yeah. from, we're going from 27 to 28 and um, uh, the new uh, governor's map creates 20 congressional districts that actually uh, voted for Trump and just eight that voted for Biden. The one that the legislature created had 18 districts that voted for Trump and 10 for Biden. So you can really see that there's gerrymandering here 
that is based on political outcome, which also is not in compliance with fair districts amendment that was passed by 63% of the voters of Florida. So the question is, why is the legislature not supporting what the voters of Florida by a huge majority have said that they want? So we have, yeah, that's, that's a big issue uh, with this map. And getting to the point of the 20 districts that were where Trump would have won in these of these 28 districts, Trump really only won Florida by a fairly small percentage when you compare everything. You know, it's it was a fairly small win, but but it might be where rep, rep, in two years Republicans are 20 representatives in of in Congress from Florida out of 28. So 20 to eight. Republicans yeah. to, to Democrats if this new map is passed and if people, of course, if people vote along the same lines they did in the 2020 election. Instead of instead of maybe 18. And like you say, in, in actuality in Florida, it's kind of it's there's not a huge, you know, there isn't that significant uh, leaning in terms of registered voters in Florida. It's it's far more balanced than that. Yeah, the term for Florida used to be a purple state. I think now it's leaning a it's little still, bit more. But it's still purple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah leaning leaning red, but definitely a, kind of a mix of things, except mm -hmm. what we'll see in Congress if this does go through and if people vote the way that they had. Well, I'm, I want to remind people that we're speaking with Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. We're talking about the special legislative session that begins this afternoon in Florida for redistricting, drawing the maps for Congress. Now, it's interesting, this same controversy didn't happen when drawing the state house and state senate dis districts, the new lines for those were passed by the legislature and those were signed by Governor DeSantis. What do you think uh, makes the difference? What, what, what made it special about the congressional seats that made uh, DeSantis want to veto those? Um, I, I have a feeling that procedurally he didn't he doesn't have the same uh capacity over the other maps but i'm not 100 percent positive on that so i'm i'm, I'm not that I, I don't know if i uh can really answer that question clearly um sorry yeah, yeah thanks for giving that a go and let's talk about the tampa bay area if we look at what the congressional map is today versus what is the one that's proposed by governor DeSantis, which is very likely to be passed by the legislature and become law at least pending litigation which we'll get to later perhaps that right excuse me right now about uh, there are two democrats in the tampa bay area kathy castor represents tampa and some of hillsborough county charlie christ represents the southernmost part of Pinellas County, and then surrounded surrounding those are a lot of Republicans, Vern Buchanan and and uh, Bill Arrakis and others. But the congressional districts in the Tampa Bay area would be redrawn under DeSantis's map, and there's only really in this map, in the new map that DeSantis draws, there's only really one clear Democratic stronghold, and that would be the Tampa district because it also now would include most of the eastern part of St. Petersburg, including downtown St. Pete. So that what that means is that the district that Charlie Crist is in would essentially lose the uh, downtown St. Pete and it would become a more red district and go all the way up the coast um, to Palm Harbor and Tarpon Springs, I believe. How would you what would you say about how that affects the Tampa Bay area if this new map is passed? I, I, this is part of why fair districts was passed. <laughs> uh, so that we, we, so this is, this is a major issue. This is part of that move from uh, 18 uh, congressional seats to 20 that lean Republican. And yeah, it's, it's, it's impacting the whole state of Florida because we have similar situations in the Orange County, Orlando area as well. So once again, this is a definitive drawing that reduces uh, representation um, for political reasons, and that is totally in violation of the Fair Districts Amendment. And just to let people, remind people, 
that was after that was about 10 years ago, m a little bit more now. The voters of Florida passed these fair district amendments, and that meant that what what did they restrict the legislature and the governor from doing when it came to drawing districts? Uh, so for uh, fair districts, um, basically means that you can't draw maps in favor specifically of a certain party um, and that you have to protect minority voting rights. So um, you really need to make sure that there's balance there. And what was interesting historically is the maps that were originally drawn uh, were really, really, really uh, not following the Fair Districts Amendment. It was taken to court. Um, it was a process that took five years all in. Uh, in the end, the Supreme Court wound up in some cases choosing, uh, selecting a map and we're kind of not going through that whole process now. Um, but once again, the maps that were selected were approved you know, by the courts. And now this is the map that the governor is saying is gerrymandered up in the, in the Northern portion of the state. Um, but based on fair districts, no, you can't draw, redraw districts and make them lean a certain way politically. Our guest is Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. You're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and this is 88.5 FM and WMNF.org. We're talking about the special legislative session that begins today. It's about drawing congressional maps, new congressional maps. The redistricting process uh, will be completed this week, perhaps, except for per what we expect to be some legal challenges. So let's talk about that right now, Sean. Lawyers and organizations and groups say that they're likely to sue if the governor's map is approved. I'm reading here from the Florida Phoenix that Mark Elias, a litigator and a founder of Democracy Docket, says there are many organizations that are tracking the special redistricting session and that there's very likely to be lawsuits. And uh, would it be going out on a limb for me to ask you if the League of Women Voters might participate in the lawsuits uh, if this map does pass? If this map moves forward, I can promise you that the League will be there uh, in the fight to keep this from moving forward. There's a lot of legal uh, uh, you know, options here. And I think what once you know we see what's happening, we're gonna have to really review how we want to proceed and what the best method for the league as a nonpartisan organization would be to proceed uh, to make sure uh, that this process uh, is, is, is not acceptable, but the map itself is not acceptable based on uh, amendment for fair districts and the Voting Rights Act. It's in total violation of that. So we will fight that map in all of the best ways that we can. And if it, if it means, you know, taking it to court, we will. And you mentioned earlier that the current map that is where, where we have our own congressional representatives, where they are situated now, that map was drawn by the courts in the past, but something has changed about the courts. And in, in, this is both in the Florida Supreme Court, and we can eventually talk about this the U.S. Supreme Court, but the Florida Supreme Court might not act the same way as it did seven years ago when it when it drew these maps. What's changed with the Florida Supreme Court? Well, there's a lot of new appointees who uh, tend to lean far more uh, conservatively, and uh, I I would hope you know the one thing that you have in Florida is that you're appointed to the Supreme Court, but later you know that has to be a followed up with the being reinstated by, by an election process. And I would hope that if this Supreme Court does not do the right thing, if it goes there, um, that those justices would be facing consequences by the voters of Florida. Um, but I would hope that they would do the right thing. There are clear, clear uh, issues here with both the Fair Districts Amendment and with the Voting Rights Act. So this is both federal and state. 
uh, but it's also the process that's happening here. Uh, so I would think that there's there's a there's a whole lot of different legal ways to approach this very challenging situation. And of course, the Voting Rights Act, that's a federal law. So eventually that might be heard as far up as the U.S. Supreme Court, which, it, as we all know, it, it's, it has changed quite a bit in the last few years and has become more conservative. Do you get the sense that um, that Governor DeSantis is emboldened by any of these changes in the courts and he thinks that uh, they might they might take a different view of things than they did recently? I definitely think he does. Yes. I do. I want to remind people that our guest is Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. And we're talking about the special legislative session that kicks off at noon today in the Florida legislature. They're going to finish up the process of redistricting. They already passed during this, the normal session. They they passed district re, new redistricting maps for the state Senate and the state House. Now they have to draw the lines for the congressional districts, which their map was vote vetoed by Governor DeSantis last month. And so DeSantis has presented them a map that we're talking about during this show today. And we'll see whether the legislature, as they said, if they pass that map, and then the, of course the governor would, would approve his own map. And this whole process, which, uh, you know, has been you, you have concerns about it, Sean, but according to Florida politics, Aramis Ayala also has concerns. She says that Florida's attorney general, Ashley Moody, is ignoring her oversight role in redistricting. And Aramis Ayala, of course, is the former state attorney from Orlando, and she's trying to run for the AG's job in the general election this fall. So what would you, how would you um, analyze what Aramis Ayala is saying about the Florida attorney general's job of kind of overseeing this, has, having an oversight role in redistricting and letting it get a little bit out of hand with the governor giving a map to the legislature? I, I would, I would, um, I really am not fluent in this area, but I would say that she probably should be getting involved um, because this does seem to really uh, it's unprecedented what's happening right now. This has never happened before. And you would think that the Attorney General of Florida would be involved in some way. Um, and uh, it's kind of shocking probably that she's not. I want to remind people that our guest is from the League of Women Voters of Florida. It's Sean Bartelt. And we're talking on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe about the redistricting process. Let me read a couple of the emails that have come in and text messages because uh, we're getting a few. And you're welcome to email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. If the only way you have to reach us is by phone, we could uh, take some phone calls as well, perhaps. The number is 813-239-9663. Uh, Twinkle writes, thank you for your guest. I'm going to join the League of Women Voters. I've been concerned of late about the fascism that seems to be growing in Florida. I don't know why we haven't learned these lessons yet, but I'm glad to hear her and appreciate it. I appreciate that my radio station uh, appreciates it as always. So thank you, Twinkle, for that note. Also, um, Karen writes, this is so disheartening. Everything DeSantis is doing to our state uh, she loves the League of Women Voters, one of her go-to guides when voting. So that's Karen and Dunedin. And we'll go back to the, um, the, the questions that I had. There's We've talked so far about the potential legal challenges. Well, there are, uh, there's already a, a lawsuit out there that is saying that the courts and not the legislature or the governor should be drawing the boundaries because of the, I guess, the shenanigans that have happened in the past. And there has been trial dates set for that trial. Now, it might be pending. They might change this once the map is approved. Who knows? But the trial dates for that lawsuit are set for next month, May 12th and May 13th. Sean, what can you tell us about that trial that's asking the courts to draw the boundaries even before the legislature and governor have come up with a final congressional map? Um, I think it's. I think a, a lot of this is going to be kind of shifting once this happens because those lawsuits were filed before the governor vetoed the maps and put forth his own map. So I think what you're going to see perhaps is a shift uh, in some of these lawsuits based on what's happening now. Um, it's um, and part of the 
you know, part of the challenge in the state of Florida in, that you brought up in having the courts draw the maps now is that the Florida Supreme Court um, is, has really shifted um, and, and is far more conservative and might, uh, I, I think in a way, I think Governor DeSantis wants to see the Fair District's Amendment eviscerated. And I think he might believe that the court would support, um, you know, kind of undoing the Fair District's Amendment, which is a little scary. So and that might I did want to, I did want to mention. I wish uh, I Cecile Schoon, our president, would have been here today, but she's part of a press conference um, put on by Equal Ground and a lot of other organizations in Tallahassee right now. Um, with the support of probably 30 or 40 other organizations statewide and very broad uh, to really talk about what's going on right here. So I just wanted to, to mention that Cecile would be here, except for the fact she's doing that press conference. And I anticipate that reporters in Tallahassee with a, an NPR affiliated Florida Public Radio affiliated station will probably be at that press conference. And so we'll try to bring mm -hmm. you news from yeah. there this afternoon. Uh, one of the strategies of at least one of the Democrats in the Florida state legislature is to talk about a boycott of the legislative session. Miami-Dade County Senator Annette Tadeo, you may, people, our audience may remember that she's also running in the Democratic primary to oppose Governor DeSantis in November. She is proposing a boycott of the special session. Uh, that boycott doesn't seem to have traction among many other Democrats, but um, I don't know if, if you have anything you'd like to weigh in on Sean, with the League of Women Voters of Florida about Senator Tadeo's suggestion of Democrats just seeing that it's a fait accompli and boycotting the special session this week. I totally understand, you know, where she is coming from. Um, but I do still believe that we have just got to put continued and enormous pressure on our legislature to stand up and do their job and not rubber stamp uh, the governor's maps, which are in a clear violation of voting rights and, and fair districts. I, I, I am hoping that they're going to choose to take a different path. And Representative Frenchus Driscoll of Hillsborough County agrees with that assessment. She sits in the House Redistricting Committee and she told the Florida Phoenix, Someone needs to be there during special session to build the record in case these maps are challenged in court. The point being that there will be time for opponents of these maps to speak out on the on the floor of the uh, the House and the Senate in the Florida legislature, and that testimony that that those words might be helpful in any lawsuits to challenge the the redistricting process. And our president Cecile Schoon will be. Uh, testifying as well. So I think we have to be there. I think we have to fight the good fight. Um, I think we have to hold the legislature accountable uh, to, to do their job, which is to draw the maps. The one thing we really didn't talk about um, that's also interesting is the recent ruling by Judge Walker on Senate Bill 90, which is a, a you know, voter suppression bill. Uh, that was passed last year, and Judge Walker took a lot of elements out of that. But in part of his 288-page um, verdict, he really detailed uh, the discrimination uh, in laws that are passed relating to voting rights in Florida. And when you look at that and all that has happened, you can see how much that game has influenced the current governor's map. It's a continuation of that process of taking away the voting rights of our minorities in the state of Florida. Which would be further eroded with this map is passed that the governor has suggested. Yes. 
Our guest is Sean Bartolt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. You're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. It's 1035 in the morning. You're listening to 88.5 FM, WMNF.org. You might also be listening on the WMNF app. Sean, I wanted to ask you, a moment ago, you were talking about the possibility that the governor might be um, almost trying to get this to the courts in order for the Florida Supreme Court to somehow overturn the Florida Fair Districts Amendment. So walk us through that. What would that be like? What would What is the, the potential for challenging the, the Florida Fair Districts Amendment? I mean, they're part of the Florida State Constitution. So it seems like, you know, for novices of people who aren't lawyers or who aren't don't study this all the time, if it's part of the Constitution, it seems pretty set in stone. So what would be the avenue be for the governor and potentially the Florida Supreme Court to do something to tear away at the these fair districts amendments? It's, it's really, uh, I mean, I just know that the concern is there among many organizations in Florida that if this does go to the Supreme Court, there would be parts of the Fair District Amendment that would be perhaps weakened um, based on their decisions and interpretation of the amendment. Uh, how that's going to happen, I can't really say, but I know that there's definitive concern among numerous organizations uh, that the, that is a potential uh, issue if this does, if maps go to the Supreme Court in Florida. Our guest is Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. We're talking about the special legislative session that begins today. This week, the Florida legislature is going to pass presumably the map that's been drawn by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis that will redraw the congressional districts in Florida. It will likely mean that there will be 20 Republicans representing Florida in Congress and eight Democrats in the near future if uh, people vote the way that they've tended to vote in the past. So that's a, a concern of, of groups that have been following the, uh, you know, the, the democracy movement, I guess you would say. Let me read some of these emails that are coming in, and I should tell people that if you'd like to call us, you can call 813-239-9663 if you have a question about redistricting, or you can send it to dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. If you text, please tell us where you're texting from and your first name. So Wendy writes, what can we do as voters now besides calling our state representatives and senators? So, uh, so Sean Bartolt from the League of Women Voters, what would you recommend people do? I would say right now, that's what we have to do. We have to reach out to them and let them know that we are not happy um, and that we want them to uh, basically do a two-thirds vote and override the veto of the governor and do their job as mandated by the Constitution. Um, after that, uh, <laughs> support the organizations, if this, if this map is passed, support the organizations that are going to be taking, um, taking that map to court. Um, and um, that that's probably the best that they can do and then inform uh inform everyone help inform everyone and share information about the fact that this is an unprecedented autocratic move by our governor really taking us away from the democracy that we as voters deserve in the state of Florida. We need to let everyone know, I don't, it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. This is an unprecedented autocratic move by the governor. That's the voice of Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. We're talking about the congressional redistricting that's occurring this week in the state of Florida legislature. It's a special session because during the regular session, the legislature passed a congressional map, a new, a new map, and it was vetoed by Governor DeSantis. 
And let's hear what the governor is saying about why he vetoed it. Last week, Governor DeSantis demanded what he called a race-neutral drawing of North Florida's congressional district. DeSantis again defended his decision to veto the legislature's controversial map, sorry, the legislature's congressional map, that is. It includes a, what's called an African-American opportunity district in Duval County, and this is Senator, uh, sorry, Congression, uh, Congress member Al Lawson's district that is in danger now. But here's, here's what the governor says why he did it. It will, though, have uh, North Florida drawn in a race neutral manner. I mean, we are not going to have a 200 mile uh, gerrymander that divvies up people based on the color of their skin. That is wrong. That is not the way uh, we've governed um, in the state of Florida. So he's Governor DeSantis saying he wants it to be race neutral and not divvying up people based on the color of their skin. We've kind of addressed this earlier in the show, but what can you say just based on, uh, you know, what the, the governor's actual words there? What's your response, Sean? I, I have to look at what the final impact is. And the impact of his map is that it is eliminating or diminishing minority access to Congress. It is really diminishing the influence that Black voters will have. And the impact is not just based on the changes he's making in North Florida, but those all trickle down. And so when you start reworking all of that, it's reworking everything throughout the state of Florida and really impacting maps in Central Florida, South Florida, um, West Coast Florida. So. And our legislature drew maps that they felt were totally compliant uh, with the Fair Districts Voting Act and with uh, the Voting Rights Act and Amendment and Act. And that he is saying that's not true. Um, the impact of this map is devastating. I'm going to take a phone call in just a second, but I want to remind people that we're speaking with Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. We're talking about the redistricting, and we just heard Governor DeSantis talking last week where he said that he wants North Florida drawn in a race-neutral manner. Um, would you characterize the map that DeSantis himself has drawn, would you characterize that as race-neutral? Uh, no, I wouldn't consider it race neutral because he's um, basically uh, really significantly limiting the uh, minority voice and representation and access in Florida. The impact in um, Val Demings, uh, U.S. Representative Congressional District in Central Florida, it's significant. Uh, and there's other districts that, as well that are going to be facing the same thing. Well, let's go to the phones right now. We have on the air, Con Connie Burton is calling in. Welcome to the show, Connie. What would you like to say about this whole issue of redistricting? Well, thank you for the topic. And of course, thank the uh, League of Women uh, for their fine work. Uh, the governor is not doing anything to increase, increase, uh, the leadership of African Americans in terms of political leadership, but it is to diminish uh, our participation and having representation as we continue to uh, deal with the old vestige of Jim Crow slavery, uh, a ton of inequality. And so while he might be able to choose the words to show that he's moving toward a uh, a race-neutral uh, state, it is further from the truth. The fact of the matter is that uh, we are moving so far backwards, we might as well as voters uh, be asked to count, black voters be asked to uh, count how many jelly beans is in a jar. Uh, I'm hoping that, uh, I have no confidence that the uh, officials in Tallahassee will be able to push back but there has to be a plan of action for people who want to be on the right side of history that we do not want Florida to end up in uh, a race uh, control 
a state where there's no minority participation. And so all organizations have to do to the greatest extent possible, uh, start doing as much as political engagement as possible. And then there has to be some type of economic consequence to the state of Florida and the governor from moving us backwards. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Connie. Thanks for calling in. And thank you for those points. And I want to turn it over now to Sean Bartolt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. What would you say about what we just heard from community activist Connie Burton's thoughts about, about Florida? And uh, she says it would be like taking a step backwards toward the Jim Crow era. This is a total step backwards. But as I said earlier, based on um, voter suppression bills that have been passed in the last two years, Senate Bill 90 uh, last year, five, I think uh, 524 this year, they're, they're really targeting uh, minority voters uh, in those bills in a lot of ways and people with disabilities. Um, and this move with these maps is a continuation of that process. And as I said, in Judge Walker's ruling, this is a plan history. This has been occurring over time with a significant push to diminish the minority voice and vote in the state of Florida. And, and this uh, is part of it. To some of us, it might be um, common sense perhaps, but let's say somebody is new to Florida and they're not sure what would the practical effect of, of reducing minority uh, uh, access to the voting booth in Florida, how would that have impact the state legislature? How would that impact the, the Congress and congressional representation in Florida? What would that mean? Well, I think it significantly, uh, it significantly affects um, the, uh, our legislature the laws that are passed. Um, I mean, when we look at this, uh, you know, when we look at the news right now that math books are being rejected because of critical race theory. And, you know, you have school districts that have already ordered these books that see absolutely nothing wrong with these books um, and they're being rejected. Uh, when you look at, uh, you know, controlling what can be taught in schools and what businesses can do uh, to address DEI concerns um, and that laws are being passed saying you, you can't have that. Um, it's, it, and then when you're gonna just say, we're gonna have even less uh, minority representation, it's only gonna get worse. And I think what we're, it, as I said earlier, we're seeing unprecedented stuff happening right now. Never before has a governor ever vetoed redistricting maps, ever. And you're talking about a Republican governor vetoing Republican maps drawn by the Republican legislature that means Republican. So this is, um, you know, it's, it's violating our constitution. And this is not a good place to be. Our guest is Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. You're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. It's 1049 in the morning. And we're talking about today's start of the Florida special session on redistricting. It will be completed this week. It probably won't take that long because essentially the legislators have already said the governor gave us a map. We're going to pass that map. So we are, I guess the rest is just the details. We're going to hear opposition to that map, I'm sure. And there's going to be people call, uh, speaking out to support it. But really, uh, it seems like there's not very much suspense in what's going to be happening this week. It seems like the governor's map will become the official uh, congressional district map for Florida. But then it also seems that it will be challenged in courts. So what do you think? 813-239-9663. You can email dj at wmnf.org or you can text 813-433-0885. I do want to head up to Pasco County right now to talk to to uh, take a call from Ted in Elfers. Hi, Ted. What would you like to say? Hi, Sean. And hello, Sean. Uh, you're making it easy on me today. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I, I always go to the League of Women Voters when I have a question about anything political and Look at what you guys say first. I found you for years a valuable resource. So thank you very much. Um, 
the one thing, the one comment that I wanted to make was uh, that it seems to be that the governor is only governing for the citizens of the state that belong to a certain religious group, and he's ignoring all the other constituents that he's supposed to be representing. He's supposed to be the governor of the state of Florida, in my opinion, most recently uh, exampled by his signing the anti-abortion law in a church, um, which doesn't that violate the separation of church and state? It just, he, he seems to not care about the people of Florida. He cares about his, the people that are giving him money is what I'm trying to say. All right, Ted, thank, thank you, you very well, much. Thank you for that comment. It is rough when 64% of the voters of Florida supported the Fair Districts Amendment and want to have fair districts that he's basically saying, I don't care what you want. Um, when our state constitution says that the maps need to be drawn by the legislature, um, that he is not, and, and I actually was very proud of our legislature um, and our legislative leaders who really worked hard to produce maps that needed to be generated by the will of the people and what they wanted. They were listening and saying, okay, we're going to do the right thing. And I just wish they would continue to do the right thing and override uh, this veto. And, you know, I don't know if you can have race balance that the governor's talking about when the Voting Rights Act basically says you, you know, you have to have balance and you have to have representation. Yeah, this whole um, race neutral concern of, of Governor DeSantis is essentially saying that the Federal Voting Rights Act is uh, is not does not apply in Florida because the the Federal Rights Act says that Florida was doing such a bad job in the past that it has to essentially take that into account and that's uh, concerns the dis the governor and he's he's pushing full throttle head against against that and we'll see where where that uh, comes up where they when they meet in in courts perhaps our guest is Sean Bartelt the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida and you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe on 88.5 FM and WMNF.org I want to read this email that came in from Mickey who says that desperate times call for desperate actions in Manatee County I register Republicans so I can vote in primaries against the worst Republicans for the most reasonable Republican Mickey goes on to say Manatee County is three Republicans for every two Democrats, I believe. So Democrats have little chance, though I vote Democrat in elections. And uh, Mickey says, thanks for the great show. And he echoes the other callers who uh, say that they that Mickey loves the League of Women Voters. So thank you for that email. And I should remind people that our guest is from the League of Women Voters of Florida, Sean Bartelt, the second vice president. And you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. Man, I believe, is the name of the person who texted in from uh, a, a little bit ago, is, has a question about the League of Women Voters. It's slightly off topic, but because it's uh, about your group, Sean, I want to ask you about this. Man says that in California, the League of Women Voters issues an educational pamphlet listing each candidate's view of various concerns. It is a nonpartisan and very helpful during election cycle. Is there any chance of similar election help in Florida? So where can people find out more about candidates and issues uh, written by and curated by the League of Women Voters? So um, every year for elections, we do vote 411. Uh, and each local league uh, creates their own content for vote 411. And in many cases, they have uh, uh, questions uh, that are submitted to all of the candidates for that race. And those answers are provided uh, in vote 411. So you can see um, you know, the responses. Uh, we are a nonpartisan organization. We do not uh, support candidates. We um, advocate for issues that we've studied. So, um, so there'll be three amendments. We'll have, you know, what the amendment will do, what it won't do, and what our position is on that. 
Um, but I would recommend vote 411 and uh, we uh, should have uh, questionnaires that candidates answer. It is unfortunate in this current divisive time that not all candidates want to participate, um, but vote 411 definitely is a great resource for voters in Florida. And again, we're speaking with Sean Bartelt, the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. And we have a caller on the line from Tampa. Nav says he support or Nav supports what the governor is doing. So, Nav, what is it that you support about what the governor is doing? Basically, I'm supporting the governor just on uh, just generically across the board, because I think he's using common sense. And if you look at Florida compared to other states, uh, post pandemic, while well, we're slowly getting out of the pandemic, you know, our economy has fared better than almost every other state in the union. And you have to attribute a lot of it to our governor. And at the end of the day, you know, rich countries, we have the luxury to have debates on, you know, social issues. But those, those issues can only be addressed when the foundation is strong. But when kitchen table issues, are a big problem for the vast majority of Americans, actually all Americans now. You don't have the luxury to have these debates on transgender and binary gender and this and that. These debates become irrelevant when the economy is bad. We're right like a third world country now where we need to get back to the basics on kitchen table issues. And I think our governor recognizes that and he knows the vast majority of the public is concerned about the economy and inflation and gas prices. And I think he's doing a good job and he's addressing that. So. I'm All right. Thanks, Nav. We're almost out of time. So I do want to get uh, my guest response. But before she does, I want to point out the fact that it's true that Florida's economy was opened up a lot more, more quickly than in other states. But for as far as big states go, if we're going to talk about New York, California, Texas, Florida, Florida is among the worst in outcomes for COVID-19 is as far as deaths per capita and as far as infections per capita. So it was definitely a trade-off that the governor made a decision to do. And I uh, think it might be a little bit premature to say that that, that unequivocally that, that decision was the correct decision. So that's just me, um, you know, pointing that one, one thing out. But what, what would you like to say, Sean Bartelt, with the League of Women Voters? How would you respond to NAV's phone call? Um, well, uh, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm a Florida native uh, and I live in Sarasota. I think part of the reason that Florida's economy did so well is that people couldn't travel anywhere. So they all came to Florida to go to the beach. So that's part of what drove our economy. But yes, our death rate per capita was significantly higher. Our infection rate was massively higher. Um, you know, there are states like North Carolina where you did have mass mandates and they had, you know, significant lower incidences. Um, but the other reason that we're doing well economically is we've taken a ton of federal money as well. <laughs> so, um, but I don't think you can just look at the economic, well, if I'm looking at the economic picture, the biggest thing that I think the legislature chose completely not to address is the housing crisis in Florida. No one, not no one, but pretty much the vast majority of people cannot afford the rents in Florida on any kind of working wage. And nothing was done by our legislature to address that, what I think, which I think was pretty awful um, and, and a, a great miss by them. Um, but, uh, you know, additionally, it's not just about the money. We have a constitution. We have amendments to that constitution that are passed by the people of Florida. It's separation of church and state. You have the power of the legislature, the power of the court and the power of the governor. And we are shifting to an autocracy Instead I'm going to have to leave it democracy. there, Sean. I'm sorry. We are, we've are we run out of time. Yeah. Sean Bartelt is the second vice president of the League of Women Voters of Florida. And I want to thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. The Florida Special Legislative Session begins today at noon. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe with Sean Canan. 
on 88.5 FM. It's every Tuesday morning at 10. Thanks to John Dunn for answering phones. We have Wavemakers coming up next with Janet and Tom Sherberger. And their guest is Freddie Barton of the Safe and Sound Hillsborough Community Violence Prevention Collaborative. Thanks so much for listening to WMNF News. That's coming up after NPR headlines. This is WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening. Mm-hmm.